Hi, welcome to China Currents. I'm Chris. If you believed Americans had put men on the moon, and it's been 50 years since the last man walked on the moon, but the hiatus is about to end now. On July 12th, China unveiled its plan to land humans on the moon by 2030. The announcement was made at a space industry farm in Wuhan, central China. Zhang Hailian, deputy chief engineer of the China Manned Space Agency's engineering office, revealed the proposed plan. First, two rockets will enter a lunar orbit, a lunar surface lander, and a manned spacecraft. After a successful docking, the astronauts will enter the lunar module to descend to the lunar surface. The double launch approach splits the task into two. Let's get around with the challenge of developing a heavy-duty rocket that is powerful enough to carry everything. A manned lunar surface mission will need both the human crew and lunar lander, as well as oxygen, water, equipment, and other mission essentials. All of which add to the weight of the payload being lifted. Once the astronauts have completed their scientific exploration and collected samples from the lunar surface, the lander will transport them back to the orbiting spacecraft, on which they will return to the Earth. The U.S. is so far the only country to put man on the moon. The Apollo missions in the 60s and 70s were highly successful, marking a U.S. victory in the space race. The Americans have been talking about getting back to the moon in recent years, yet due to its deindustrialization policies, the U.S. had found it difficult to restart the lunar mission. The successful execution of China's ambitious mission will undoubtedly pave the way for human exploration of Earth's celestial neighbors. And many observers have said that the U.S. will be the underdog when the Chinese walk on the moon, a jealous watcher. Well, I don't think so. At least Americans will now have a witness to testify that the Apollo mission weren't just a huge stunt happened in LA studio. And next up, China's anti-corruption campaign. On July 13th, Chinese authority launched an investigation into Shanghai official Dong Yunhu. The announcement was made by the National Commission of Supervision and the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, the country's top anti-corruption agency. Dong Yunhu is the chairman of the Standing Committee of Shanghai's Municipal People's Congress, which makes him the top legislator in the city. As the deputy mayor of Shanghai, he has been involved in numerous high-profile projects, which may become the source of his corruption. Dong is suspected of seriously violating both party disciplines and laws. He is detained as of this moment. The Chinese public has been vocal in their support for the government's effort to combat corruption, which is seen as an important measure to foster transparency and strengthen public trust. The investigation of Dong Yunhu by CCDI further demonstrates the government's emphasis on rooting out corruption and building an accountable administration. Some netizens concluded that the investigation highlights China's resolution in cracking down corruption over the long run and shows the party will take a tougher stance and measures in combating corruption to better fulfill its mission. Next up, a piece of news in technology. Chinese company had just achieved 100% domestic production of high-end wafer laser cutting equipment components. Chinese manufacturer Huagong Tech Company had announced the production of China's first high-end wafer laser cutting equipment, utilizing only domestically manufactured core components. As electronic devices become increasingly essential in modern technology and in information age, semiconductor chips, the heart of these devices, have emerged as a critical focus for the United States in its sanctions against China and efforts to contain technological advancement. Wafers, the foundation of semiconductors, plays a vital role in producing these chips, and this precision is crucial for optimal performance. Wagon Technologies' innovative upgrade in wafer cutting technology has successfully eliminated a heat-affected zone, controlled chipping size within five micrometers, and limited cutting line width to 10 micrometers. This groundbreaking achievement showcases China's ability to independently research and manufacture high-end wafer laser cutting equipment, signifying a stride towards self-reliance in the nation's semiconductor industry. On July 3rd, China launched a counterattack by imposing export controls on important semiconductor materials such as gallium and germanium, as well as related items. Now, every move made by either side of the chip war has been closely watched. Well, next up, we all love pandas. According to the Chinese embassy in South Korea, on July 11th, the giant panda Aiba, living in South Korea's Samsung Everland, gave birth to a pair of female twin cubs on the morning of July 7th. This is the second time that the giant pandas Aiba and Lebao have given birth in South Korea, 
following the birth of Fu Bao in 2020. Currently, the mother and cubs are in good health. Female giant pandas only go into heat once a year, with a peak period of only three days. The birth of each new giant panda cub is highly anticipated. This news quickly topped Weibo's trending topics, with many netizens sending their blessings and expressing their gratitude to the Korean people's care and love for the giant panda family in South Korea. Since the Memphis Zoo's alleged mistreatment of giant panda Yaya was exposed by Chinese and American netizens, Chinese citizens have increased their attention and supervision of the living condition and treatment of pandas leased abroad. Meanwhile, Everland's high regard for giant panda breeding and scientific management has been highly praised by Chinese people. The two giant panda keepers have even become internet sensations in China and South Korea, admired by many. Next up, Jack Ma. Chinese regulatory authorities imposed a fine of 7.1 billion yuan, approximately 985 million US dollars, on Ant Group, the parent company of Alibaba. The authorities accused the company of violations in payment and financial services regulations. This penalty marks the end of a three-year investigation into the group, which was the cause of a Jack Ma's resign a few years ago. It was widely believed that this action will conclude Beijing's scrutiny of Ant Group allowing them to resume their postponed initial public offering, which is expected to happen soon. Ant Group, founded by Alibaba's co-founder Jack Ma, was initially known as Alipay. As a digital payment system, Alipay quickly became a leading player in Chinese online market, alongside Tencent's WeChat Pay. It quickly expanded into Ant Financial Services Group, Alibaba's financial arm, which also provides wealth management products. Currently, Jack Ma is no longer the controlling shareholder of Ant Group. The financial regulatory authorities have expressed their commitment to ensure businesses are subject to equal regulatory standards to achieve fair supervision. Netizens in China praise the government's effort in setting up rules. As one Chinese saying indicates, nothing can be accomplished without rules and standards. The conclusion of the investigation and the establishment of new laws cleared the confusions that was in the financial industry. Investors now have a clear sense of what they can do and how they can do. People believe that the business environment is improving and private enterprises are gaining. Next up, news on Sino-Russian relations. On July 10th, Chinese President Xi Jinping met with Valentina Matvienko, chairwoman of the Federation Council of the Federal Assembly of Russia. The two parties agree to deepen economic and cultural connections and to strengthen communication and cooperation within multilateral mechanisms including BRICS and Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Matvienko's visit is at an interesting timing. Following the Wagner incident, many speculated that China was losing confidence with Russia as the Russo-Ukrainian conflict drags on. Now Matvienko's visit breaks the guesswork. Commentators on Chinese social media regard this as a signal that shows China's commitment to Russia remains unwavering, including seeing Russia as an indispensable partner in multilateral cooperations. Some also point out, as Sweden joining NATO, Russia might seek to strengthen economic ties with China to balance its defense pressure. Next up, we have an interesting topic regarding marriage. Recently, some netizens commented on the website of the Ministry of Civil Affairs, stating that the current requirement of marriage registration is unreasonable. In order to get married, one needs to provide his or her household registration. In China, young people are oftentimes registered in their parents' household until they're married. Therefore, technically, parents can interfere with a kid's marriage by not providing registration documents unless they approve the future spouse. As netizens argue, this approach is in conflict with the principle of marriage of freedom stipulated in the Constitution. Young people thus suggest to revise this regulation. The department replied on July 6 that they will pay attention to the suggestions of netizens. In Chinese bureaucratic language, will pay attention means to revise. The swift response is probably due to China's low marriage rate and consequently birth rate. The government is willing to sweep any obstacle lies between being single and getting married, especially when it comes to a procedural issue. Last but not least, on July 11th, Bulgari issued an official apology statement on Weibo after netizens noticed that Taiwan was listed as a country on the company's website. Despite the apology, Chinese netizens did not accept it, saying that their expression was insincere. 
Meanwhile, netizens found out that Bulgaria's official statement was not published globally. Chinese official media People's Daily later commented, don't make apology exclusively for China. This controversy dominated trending topic on Weibo. Currently, Bulgaria invested in 93 boutiques in mainland China, spreading across key provincial capitals in first and second tier cities. Jean Christopher Baban, CEO of Bulgaria, said China is the most important market for Bulgaria, even more important than the local Italian market. He also said that in the luxury market, China's potential is much higher than South Korea's. Well, if you wish to profit in the Chinese market, the minimum request is to respect her sovereignty. In recent years, many multinational corporations have made mistakes on issues regarding Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Xinjiang. Some were even forced to pull out. As netizens commented, you can't expect the Chinese people to buy your stuff while taking the insults. For the Chinese customers, it's like, I'm about to give you all my money, and all I'm asking in return is to give me respect. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you have any thoughts or comments about our show, please reach us at the email address below. I'm Chris, looking forward to hearing from you. See you next time.